Good morning. So I have a, a statement here. I don't know, it's not really a question, it's a challenge. And the challenge is to try to understand the depth from which you were rescued. And the issue really is that we've been rescued from something we have yet to experience or haven't experienced. Let me explain what I mean here. Uh, this is something that most of us, and I'm assuming, maybe a few of you have spent a night in jail, I don't know, and I, I don't need to know, uh, but it's one thing to be rescued from something you know, like you're in jail and you are pardoned and you get released, okay, or paroled. You experience that because you've been in prison and you know what it's like, and you're glad very thankful when you, especially if you know you're guilty and you receive a uh, pardon anyway, and uh, that then you kind of say, yeah, I know what it's like and I don't want to be back there again. Here's another photo. This is an older one. And, you know, you kind of look behind those doors there and it's, it's, that's despairing even to look at that, isn't it? And none of us here have been there. I assume. Of course, it's an older picture, so I can almost guarantee that none of us have been here behind these things. So uh, when, when we talk about salvation, we're talking about being saved from something that is very much alone in eternity and in despair and certainly in great agony as the scriptures declare. But we've not experienced that, and yet we've been rescued from it or saved from it. And so how do you become thankful for something that you really haven't experienced? Now think about that for a second, okay? And that's the challenge that we have. Today we're going to continue our story, uh, not a story, but our, our talk in Ephesians chapter uh, 2. So if you have a Bible with you, uh, you can turn, start turning to that page here. That's on page 700, or 976 will be in Ephesians chapter 2. But we're talking about the fact that each and every one of us were, in a sense, born condemned, uh, knowing that we have this sin nature, and that sin was going to uh, show itself in rebellion against God and in our motives that were self-serving and kind of living your life with a fist up at God. I don't need you. I don't want you. I'm going to do what I want to do. And yet when we come to Christ, we're set free from not just the penalty of our sin, but from the desire to sin. And so we've been rescued, we've been set free, the handcuffs are now empty, they were around our wrists, but they're no longer. And how do we become truly thankful for something that we're not really, can really understand too much about it? That's what I'm challenging us today. And I think that's the challenge that the people in Ephesians had in, in understanding their, their salvation. Uh, chapter 1 of Ephesians really just spoke about the grand grace of God, the glorious grace of God, and how it was, we, we experienced that in, in being uh, you know, chosen to be loved by God, predetermined that we would be a, uh, adopted and conformed to the image of his son, uh, recipients of this great inheritance that we can't even get our minds around. We know, we believe we're going to have eternal life, but there's so much to this inheritance of Christ that we're not even able to comprehend. We're given all this stuff here. And now the apostle, what I, what I sense in this and what I would challenge you to think about too is going to go in chapter 2 of Ephesians and bring us kind of down to where we used to be so that we would really see and understand, hopefully, the real depth of God's love for us. I mean, Jesus tells this story in, in Luke. Actually, it's not a story. It's a story about Jesus. Jesus is invited to uh, the home of a Pharisee for, for, for a meal, and the Pharisee's name was Simon. And when the meal is being served, all of a sudden this woman comes into that house and she is well known by Simon, the Pharisee, that she is a prostitute. And she comes 
behind Jesus and starts weeping at his feet, you know, and she, her tears are covering his feet and she's wiping the tears with her hair. And Simon is thinking to himself, you know, Jesus, if you really were this prophet that you claim to be, you would know what kind of woman she is and you would let her touch you. Well, Jesus being God, he knows what he's thinking. So he says, Simon, let me ask you a question. Uh, he says, Go ahead and ask. And Jesus says, who is more, who would love more, the person who is forgiven little or the person who is forgiven much? Well, Simon answers correctly. He says, well, I suppose the person who's forgiven much will love more. And Jesus, you're absolutely right. Now here this woman comes in here and, and you have not done anything for me. You haven't washed my feet or anything. And, and she comes in here and is washing my feet with her hair. And I'm telling you, Simon, that she who has been forgiven much loves much. Think about that. And so what we're going to be looking at here is really kind of the depth of what we've been forgiven from. And the reason it's brought out is so that we would love more. That we would really understand the depth of God's love for us. So let's kind of begin here in verses uh, 1 through 3 here. In chapter 2, he's... Paul, the apostle, he, he writes these words here. He says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Wow, that's pretty condemning, isn't it? And what he's saying is this, this was you. This is who you were. And this, these aren't pleasant words. Now, he didn't write these things. But, you know, the, the Spirit of God did not inspire Paul, the apostle, to write these things in order to put you down, to, to kind of grind you into the ground, to make you feel like dirt, to say you're nothing but a worm, you're disgusting, you're a terrible person. That's not the purpose of these writings, okay? He's writing these words to show you the depth of God's grace so that we would be more grateful for it and really understand the depth of his love for us and love him more back in return. That's, what it's, that's what's going on here. So he says, and you were dead in the trespasses of your, uh, uh, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins. So this, this isn't a physical death. It's a spiritual death. And so when you try to understand death, what you're saying is uh, a, a, a thing that is dead is not responsive. Uh, if, if there's an animal that's dead, you can poke it, you can tickle it, you can throw water on it, and this animal will not respond because it cannot respond. That's death, the inability to respond. So what he's talking about here is when we were in our natural born self, we are unable to respond to God's love. We are dead. And we're dead because we remained in our trespasses and sins. Now, this word trespasses and sin, they, they may be just two words to say the same thing, but I'm going to say it's a little bit different here. Trespasses is like crossing into, uh, over boundaries that you're not supposed to go. Okay, like no trespassing. God puts a sign out there, no trespassing in these areas of self-focus, of, of meanness, of hurting other people, of, of, uh, of being opposed to God. And the sins refer to those acts that you do once you've crossed that boundary. And while you're in that area of trespassing, you were dead to God. Absolutely dead. You, couldn't you didn't understand God's love. Even if God were to shower you with it, you wouldn't have been able to respond. You were unable because there was no spiritual life in you. And he says, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit of this, we'll, we'll see more of that in a second here. But see, it says you formerly walked here. This is a way of saying this is how you lived your life. When I say you, I'm including me in on this, okay? In fact, Every single person ever born lived 
in their lives opposed to God, dead to God. And we walk that way according to the course of this world. Now, the course of this world, if I were to sum it up, it would be that uh, you are your own God. This is what the world teaches you. You get to determine what is right and wrong. You have this emptiness within you, and so you try to find life and meaning of life through the things, the possession of things in this world, through power, through using of other people. You can fill in the blank. He says, this is, how, this is what the world teaches you. And I've said this before, this old beer, Schlitz, Schlitz beer commercial when I was a kid. I, it'd be on TV all the time in the, in the 60s, I guess it was. And they say, you only go around once in life, so get all the gusto you can. You know, maybe some of you are nodding it because only one person nodded too. They, they remember that commercial, right? It's basically saying this, it's all up to you to enjoy life. And that's what you live for, to enjoy life, to be, find pleasure, to feel fulfilled and meaning through the things that you gather around yourself. This is a course or the teachings or the philosophy of this world, and you lived in it before you came to Christ. Now, it also says according to the prince of the power of the air. Anybody want to know, guess who that is? You all know, right? Satan. People Jesus believed in Satan. The scriptures teach about Satan. Satan is a fallen angel, and he has been given dominion over this world by Adam when Adam and Eve decided to obey their own desires, and they obeyed Satan. They were handing him the title of this world, and he rules this world, certainly limited by the power and the authority of God and his sovereignty, but he is a power of the prince of the air. And why the air? because that's the realm that spiritual beings live in, but it's, it's speaking of here of this great um, influence that he has on people. And so there are three enemies we have here. Our sins and trespasses, which we formerly walked, the flesh, the influence of this world, and the power of Satan. And it imprisoned us, and it kept us dead from God. He goes on here and he says, um, he says, of the spirit, all of us lived among them at one time. And what were we doing at this one time? Gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following the thoughts or uh, following the desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Or as it says in the scripture that I read, uh, we were children of wrath. We'll talk about that in a second here. But all of us, now, now one of the things he's talking about here is, you remember the first century, the first believers were Jewish. And a Jewish mindset or thinking was that, of course I'm going to be saved. I'm a Jew. I'm a descendant of Abraham. And of course, you Gentiles, you don't belong with us. And what Paul is saying to them, say, no, you are all, all of us. Jews and Gentiles alike lived gratifying the desires and the cravings of our flesh. What does that give us a picture of? It's essentially this here, and that is we, we are empty on the inside, empty of sense of being beloved, being secure, and have meaning in life. And so that emptiness within us is craving to be filled with something. And so we go to this world and, and we listen to the world philosophies and Satan is imposing his, his influence on us. And so we do nothing but follow the desires of our cravings and our thoughts and we pursue things. And uh, do you dare not get in my way because you will be a casualty if you get in my way. I will use people as they use me, okay? And I know this is a pretty dark picture here, but he says we were by nature, it says deserving of wrath or children of wrath. To be a child of wrath, well, if you are a child of God, you inherit, inherent, inherit the kingdom of God. But as a child of wrath, what do you inherit? The judgment of God. So that's kind of what it's saying here. You are deserving of wrath. You were. Now, why is all this brought out? It's brought out because... It is the desire of God that we recognize the depth of his love 
and certainly grow in our appreciation of it in order that we would love him more and value this relationship we have with him because we know from which we have come. And, and the difficulty we have is that sometimes we have short memories or our memories are kind of shallow. Well, I wasn't as bad as other people. Well, that may be true because you're comparing yourself to other people. But when we compare ourselves to Jesus Christ, the more we know Jesus Christ, the greater the distance is between our character and his character. And sometimes we have to kind of go back and remember uh, what, where we are headed in life here. If you were a parent and you had a teenage driver and that teenage driver was driving recklessly, speeding, goofing off, and they end up like this, when they're sober-minded, you might want to take them back and show them, this is what happened to you. Do you remember? I don't want you to go back there. It's not necessarily a bad idea to help people reminisce about things that they used to be in order that they're grateful that they are now safe, right? To help them remember that you were headed towards crashing. You were going down the pit in life. By the way, this is a picture of a young lady. If you look at the upper right-hand corner, that's her car. She went off a ravine, and for nine hours she was trapped down there. Finally, she was able to crawl up and saved herself. But, you know, that's, that's a memory for her. And my point is being here, and, and the point I think that the Apostle Paul is making here is that don't forget from that, don't forget that which you were saved from. Because the moment you forget, start to forget that which you were saved from, you'll forget more and more the depth of God's love for you and what he saved you from. And again, the purpose of this is not reminding you're, you're a terrible driver, look what happened to you. It's to remind you somebody loves you, and if they loved you when you were in this condition, there's nothing you can do now that would prohibit God from loving you. If he loved you when you were in the depth of your sin, he'll love you every day. Not more, but not less. Well, now that Paul has kind of got us all in this idea, say, wow, I, I hope that we can say to ourselves, I was undeserving. And that's what God wants us to know. Not, not to sit there and say, you know, you're so lucky I saved you. You didn't deserve it. That's not what he's getting at. He's saying, I want you to understand how much I love you. When you are so unlovable, when you're so unworthy of grace, that's when I loved you. And we're saved by that grace here. Verses 4 through 9. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised up with him, and seated, with, seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing, it is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. And so now he's given us this huge picture, this divide. Uh, he showed us where we were, and now he's showing us the depth of God's love, which could only have been demonstrated to the degree that it is as we are more undeserving the more God's love is shown. And that's what it's going at here. I want to show you how undeserving you were, how undeserving I am. It goes on because of his great love for us and God who is rich in mercy 
To be rich in anything means you have excess, more than enough, right? So what he's saying here is because of his great love for us, it wasn't because we are so worthy of being loved. It's not because we are so lovable. It's because of the character of God. Now, I want you to all of us, myself included in on this, this isn't mean, oh, I can live any way I want. God will still love me. Well, that's true, but that is not loving him back. And that, it, it, the better way to say it, wow, I can't be worthy of this love, and yet I want to live reflecting this love in my life by loving him back. So because of his great love, uh, who is rich in, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions. Now, here is something that Bible teachers and scholars and theologians kind of wrestle with this whole idea. How can somebody who is dead respond to God's love and accept Christ as their Savior? That's something that they talk about a lot. And this seems to be saying that Christ has to make you alive in Christ so that you can understand his love. And so we have this sovereign act of God in our salvation, yet we have to respond, which we'll see in a second here. But you are so dead and you remain dead until the Spirit of God makes you alive in Christ and then you understand his love and it is by grace you have been saved. He's going to repeat this a couple times. So I'm just going to leave this. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Now look at this next sentence. In order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. So we are already in God's divine book, in his understanding, in his sovereignty, we are already seated in the heavenlies. We're there, maybe not physically, or certainly not physically, and even not in our spirit, but our names are written up there. We have this reservation, and it is as good as God's word. Okay? And God's word says your name is there, you will be there. Now, the interesting thing that, that I kind of look at here, in, where it says, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, this is not a one and done thing. Okay, I saved you, you've got my grace, it's done. No, it's, it's something that is going to, in the ages to come, and I would understand the ages to come as what we would say the afterlife, when we pass from this world into heaven, that grace is going to be continually shown to us and given to us throughout these ages. And what does that mean? I'm not quite sure. Certainly there is this inheritance, there's eternal life, and that eternal life is God's grace that is going to be given to us forever and ever and ever. But there seems to be something magnificent that is awaiting us that God will show us in the ages to come. And it's incomparable. Incomparable means you say, show me in this world what it looks like. You know, one of the reasons when God, why God never gave people his name when they would ask in the Old Testament, like Moses, well, who is your name? Uh, Manoah was the father of Samson. And when the angel of the Lord, meaning the Lord, came and told his wife that you're going to have a son, uh, Manoah was able to meet with him and says, tell us your name. And the angel of the Lord, who is God, says, why do you ask since it is beyond understanding? Because people would ask a name so then they could take that name, they'd look around the world and say, okay, uh, okay, now I understand who you are because this world reflects that name or this thing in the world. But there's nothing in the world that God can say compares to what he is going to show us in heaven. So he says it's incomparable. What he's saying, there's nothing in your experience, there's nothing in your mind, there's nothing even in your imagination that you can look at and say, oh, I understand what it's going to be like. And God says, no, you do not understand what it's going to be like because there's nothing that you can, in this world, can hang your hook, uh, a hook that you can hang this thought on and say, okay, I got it. I understand who you are now, God. I understand what heaven is going to be like. God says, you can understand there will be no death. 
no more suffering, because you experience those things. But beyond that, you can't until you get there, and I start to show you. This is something of the God, grace of God. But his grace really is, sums up here by grace, you have been saved through faith. And grace is God's something that you are given that you don't deserve, but it's not yours until what? To you, not just believe, because if it, you really believe, you will then receive it. And faith is, are those two things, I believe and I receive. If I say I believe but don't receive, I really don't believe. I really don't believe it. If I really believed something, I would, it would affect the way I live, and that's what saving faith is. I believe enough that I receive. And faith is not blind. You've heard this before, called blind faith. There's nothing in Scripture that supports the idea that we're to have blind faith. This isn't uh, just trust me and this blank idea in your mind, okay, I, I guess I'll, I'll trust. No, God wants you to take this truth, ruminate, think about it, understand it to the best of your ability, and then you respond. Then you respond. And so when the gospel message is presented, it would pref God would prefer you to say, okay, here's a gospel message for you. Uh, you were lived in the, apart from God. You've sinned. Everybody has sinned. Everybody's rebelled against God. And yet God is not indifferent to you. In fact, he reaches out to you in his love by sending his son to die on the cross for your sins so that you don't have to die for that. Your guilt is removed. So I want you to think about that for a second. Do you believe that it is something is true? Do you believe that it's something that you want in your life? If so, then I would invite you to receive Christ as your Savior. Invite him into your heart. Invite him into your mind. Whatever words you want to say. But you are saying, Jesus, you died for my sins and I need a Savior. And you're the man for me. Come into my life as my Savior, as my Lord. It's not say, hey, Jesus died for your sins so quickly, get on your knees and pray this prayer. That's God, how do I say this? That would be insulting of your freedom and insulting of your intelligence. And God is not out there to insult you. He, he knows that you're capable of understanding and believing if you want to. And so by grace you have been saved by this faith that understands and responds and is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God, not of the result of works that no one can boast. It's just so clear to me, and I know it is to you also, that this isn't a 50-50 thing. God, you do my, your part and then I'll do my part. There are some religions out there that says, well, Christ's death on the cross makes you save a bull. Now you must do the rest to save yourself. And that is so unbiblical, and it denies the reality that we're dead to, our, to God. There's nothing we can do to win God's approval or to undo sin. The only thing that undoes, undoes sin is a sacrifice that God prescribed. If you murder your, the image of God in yourself, the murder is the only due punishment for that is death for murder. You've killed yourself, killed your image of God, you've destroyed your relationship with God, now you must pay the penalty for that. But wait, how about if I pay it for you? Because God's interest is in you for eternity. And there's a, well, what do you want me to do about it? And God says, just believe. No, that's too easy. No, that's pride. You know, like you want to put your stamp of approval on it here? It's just not, no one may boast before God. Um, I think this is the Kansas City Chiefs celebrating what? Super Bowl. Super Bowl. How would you feel if you were one of those players, if me being a fan, and I'm not a fan of the Kansas City Chiefs, but if I were, I were to run out on the field and put my hand on that trophy? I didn't earn it, 
and you would probably be appalled, how would these players feel? I don't think they would appreciate that at all. Or, the, you know, every year the president invites uh, World Series champions, uh, the Stanley Cup playoff champions, NBA champions. Uh, they don't invite tennis champions, but maybe they do. But anyway, Super Bowl champions, they get to go to the White House. And in the back there is a team. Now, this is a photo op for all those fans, right? They should run up there and get behind the guys and put their arms around each other and say, look what we have done. It's just not going to happen. The Secret Service would tackle these guys and that would be the end of their desire. Because it is just like unfathomable that you would think that you get to get up here and do something uh, or claim some uh, power or claim to have been a participant in this when you have done nothing deserving of that glory and that honor. And this is nothing compared to what Christ has done when he suffered on the cross. And you think about that, if, if somebody wants to take credit, and I don't have a picture of this cross, but just think about that. Uh, there's Jesus in, who has suffered for us, who being pure and holy, drinks in the wrath of God, the sin of mankind. How dare somebody think, and I want to add to that work. I think that would be appalling to the rest of us, and it should be. What do we get credit for? Anything? Well, our sin. But then Jesus takes the credit for that too. And even that fact that when we, well, I take credit for my faith. Well, you were dead. God enabled you to have that faith and to trust in him. All we can do is just be amazed at the love of God. And that's why this book was written. That you would be amazed at the depth of God's love. And far too often, we struggle with the fact that God must not love me because I got a tough life. Well, yes, some of you have a very tough life right now. And yet this should be an encouragement to you because it won't be tough for eternity. And we can weather the trials of this world. This deadens its pain. It lessens its impact on us when we know that we are loved so greatly for God. And where do the good works come in? Because good works are part of our salvation, but not to earn our salvation, but they are the result of our salvation. Okay? And that's where we have to just get the order right here. Faith, then works. Not works plus faith, but faith. God's grace, our faith, then works. He says this in verse 10. The Apostle Paul says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So we're God's handiwork. You think of a potter who is forming clay, and this analogy is used in Scripture. Uh, where the scripture will talk about us like clay that God is forming. And so that's kind of the idea of we are his handiwork. But what is he forming you? What is he forming in you? Is it not the character of Christ? And whose other character would you rather have? I mean, you can think of somebody who is a great, wonderful musician, athlete, uh, powerful businessman or businesswoman, uh, somebody who you who admire, and just because they do something, does that mean you want that person's character to be formed in you? Uh, maybe, but if you were to read the Gospels, which I'm sure you have, you would say, no, I'd rather be like Jesus. And that's the handiwork of God in you, because you can't make yourself like Jesus, but he does. And how does he do it? Uh, you were created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for you to do. So he's saying that, uh, I have, uh, God is saying to us, I have paved this road for you to walk down, and you, have to, you are going to journey down this road if you want to, and in this journey, you are going to be confronted with things and situations and circumstances and people 
which is going to cause you to stop in your tracks and do something different that is normal. And in doing this different thing, it is going to change your character to be that like Christ. In other words, he created uh, you with extra food so that you could help this person who does not have food. He gave you extra financial resources so that you might help this person over here who's out of work. You may have a, a stronger body so that you can help this person do some laborious things in their life here. And I'm just going to say that, that doing good works is, is like this here. It's, it's not normal. This is not normal living. Nobody in their day thinks about, gee, I'm going to do the hard walk today. No, they walk down the sidewalks or drive their car where it's easy. But good works is going to stop you in your tracks and cause you to do something hard, difficult, challenging in order to help people. But you're going to be stronger. These people that do this kind of stuff are stronger. They get stronger muscles in their stomach and their shoulders and their legs and arms and, and all this. And also they're stronger in their head because they think, I'm going to do this, I can do this, even though it's hard. And that's what good works are. Sometimes they're easy to do and sometimes they're not. But, but, and sometimes they're really dirty getting in the mud for other people. It's an obstacle course. It's a trial that God says it's going to be, ultimately, it's for your good, not so much, and you think, well, it's helping other people. Say, well, it is, but it really is for your good is why we have obstacle courses. It's like this here, you're running in life, and these people who stop to carry this other runner, they're not going to win the, the human race. They're not going to get any kind of human glory out of this, are they? There's not a ribbon waiting for them because they stopped in their race to carry somebody else across the finish line. They don't give, re the world doesn't give rewards for that. But who would you rather have as your friend in life? Who would you rather walk in life, th this life through? Wouldn't you rather have somebody that would pick you up and carry you? Or the person that gets the blue ribbon because they won the race, the race of human, human race and those values. This is, this is what God is preparing you to do, to carry somebody who needs to be carried. He may have crippled you, figuratively speaking, so that somebody can carry you across the finish line. But what does this ultimately do? It bonds us together in love, as nothing else can. Real love is not seen in giving pleasure to one another. Real love is coming alongside and staying bonded to one another through the thick and thins of life. And this is what God is preparing us to do in life. So, Father, we thank you so much for this continued message from your scriptures of how great your grace is, how good your love is, and how much we are so undeserving of this love. Help us to know every day the depth of this love. Let us not get caught up in the things of this world that seem to say that you don't care. Let us remember that by the cross you've shown yourself that you do care. And may we listen to your words and your spirit and not the callings and complainings of this world. But let us rejoice in the fact that you love us, you saved us, and now you've given us a task in this world to help others so that we can become more like your son, Jesus Christ, in whom's name we pray today. Amen.